Hi, everybody. My name is Noah Sanders. On behalf of LitQuake, thank you so much for coming out to LitCrawl San Francisco. Uh, tonight is the closing night of LitQuake, San Francisco's literary festival. We're in the midst of a virtual LitCrawl, which is running from 10.30 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. this evening with 25 events broadcasting from seven cities around the world. It's a nonprofit festival, nearly 100% free, and could not exist without the, the generosity of our individual donors. If you believe in keeping literature a key component of San Francisco's cultural landscape, and we think you do, please consider dropping us a few dollars. Every bit helps. We accept donations on Venmo at LitQuake, on PayPal at info at litquake.org, or directly at litquake.org. After the event, you'll be asked to fill out a short survey. These surveys are essential in our efforts to keep LitCrawl free. Now let's get started with our events. Here to introduce it is Beverly Pereno. Thank you, Noah. Hi, everyone. Good evening, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining uh, the Lit Crawl event featuring Paula and Devon. My name is Beverly Pereno. I'm a writer based in Oakland. I'm on the board of directors of Paula. Uh, Paula is a literary arts organization and publisher, and we're dedicated to supporting and promoting Filipinx writers in the US and around the world. Um, my co-host today will be Amy Fun of Devon, and Amy will say a little bit about um, the, the Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network. Thank you, Beverly, for the invitation to partner with this reading. Um, my name is Amy Phan. I am a writer based in Berkeley, and I am a core member of the, Di the Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network. Our mission is to promote voices and stories of the Vietnamese diaspora through nurturing writers, poets, and artists, and connecting their work to readers, audience, and communities all over the globe. And uh, we're so happy to be part of this event, um, bringing together these four amazing writers. Thank you, Amy. So I just wanted to say I had the pleasure of uh, working on a few projects with Devon over the past year with executive director Isabel Pello. And we would talk about, wouldn't it be cool if we, you know, our two organizations could get together sometime and read together. And we have had some collaborations in the past, but we have um, never read together for Lit Crawl. So this is a first. And I think um, with our, the situation we're all in and being on Zoom, we have the ability to collaborate in ways that we might not have in the past. Um, we have readers, uh, we've got Tony in North Carolina, I think Paul's out in New York, Grace is in Boston. We have TK, I think, in Southern California. Um, so just wanted to say I'm really happy that we were all able to come together. Our first reader tonight is the lovely Grace Talusan. Grace is the author of The Body Papers, a New York Times Editor's Choice selection, the winner in nonfiction for the 20th Annual Massachusetts Book Award, and the winner of the Restless Books Prize for New Immigrant Writing. Born in the Philippines and raised in New England, she is the Fanny Hurst Writer-in-Residence at Brandeis University. Welcome, Grace. Thank you. Thank you, Litquake, Devon, Pawa, and of course my fellow writers. It's such an honor to be here tonight. Um, so I'm gonna read from an essay that will be published this week in an issue of Anomaly, which was edited by Grace Lowe Prasad. And um, because All Souls Day is coming up, this is related to that. And this is for Antonio Toulousan. I am riding in the front passenger seat of a rental van in Lubbock, Texas for my uncle's funeral. The caravan of mourners is so long that I can't see his hearse. People seem different in Texas. No one has to ask, but once they see us coming, vehicles pull over and stop until all of us pass. They are not in such a hurry. Drivers in Boston beep impatiently if you don't immediately move when the light blinks green. The drivers in Texas watch our procession respectfully. They recognize the gravity of this moment. A person has died and crossed the final border into eternity. A person who was once alive and driving on these very roads has died. Stop your car. That person was my uncle, my father's oldest brother. Every time I saw my uncle at a family wedding or event, for years he would invite me to visit him in Lubbock. He wanted to show me his ranch. 
I wanted to go sincerely, but I never seemed to have enough time or money to make the trip. When I found out that Tito Tony died, I did not hesitate, even though the last minute airline ticket was four times its usual price, and I had waited too long. In the 1970s, my uncle had appeared as the on-air physician on the weekly Philippine TV show, Kapwa Ko Mahal Ko, translated roughly as My Brother's Keeper, a program broadcast on the GMA network, which shared the stories of patients needing medical and financial help. After four decades, the show still airs, a sort of early version of the now ubiquitous videos for crowdsourcing campaigns, where even employed Americans must plead for help to cover expenses when faced with unexpected catastrophe. When I introduced myself to other Filipinos, sometimes they would hear my last name and ask if I was related to that kind doctor from the TV. It was a jarring experience in America, this name recognition, after a lifetime of feeling so foreign, even imaginary. At the gravesite, I stand around the rectangle of earth with fellow mourners and stare at his headstone, the shiny slab already cut with our last name. It is shocking to read my last name on a tombstone. My extended family in the Philippines regularly visits the cemeteries where our dead lie especially on All Souls Day, and sweep the grass of debris. But we are still too new in this country, luckily, to have any grave sites to clean. Does one belong more to the country where one is born or the country where one is buried? I was conceived in a place where two years after I began, I left with my parents, cutting off from our family tree grafting this branch onto an American one, the way that an apple tree can bear multiple varieties of apples by joining the old wood with the new. The life that I would have lived as a Filipino ended and a new American life bloomed. But my life didn't bear fruit. I don't have any children to clean my grave site during All Souls Day. Besides, we don't even practice this ritual very much in America. Even though I am the one who asked this question, where does an immigrant belong? I can't answer it. Anyways, I won't be buried, but rather burned. Have I ever felt as though I belong to a place? I've only ever belonged to people, to those who I love. During our first years in America, periodically packages arrived from the Philippines with news of our clan. I still remember the rough paper of these packages, the canceled stamps, the flowery handwriting, how foreign the package seemed as we sat around it at the kitchen table in Boston, my father carefully slicing through the layers of brittle brown tape. Inside were grainy photos of my Aunt Baby in white feeding wedding cake to her husband, my godmother Lija smiling grief-stricken next to her husband's open casket. School pictures of my parents' godchildren with their names and ages scrawled on the back. There were also cassette tapes, letters written in sound, but by then I could no longer understand Tagalog. And I did not sigh the way my parents did when they heard these voices, these songs from our lost world. I had lived with these relatives in our family compound back in the Philippines since the day I was born, but now they were strangers to me. My father did not plan on us staying so long in America. We were supposed to return and be reunited with everyone in the family compound. Being the resourceful immigrant that he is, he reused those cassettes, taping over the familiar voices with music from his vinyl record albums that he wanted to listen to in the car. Why buy new when you can recycle? My father didn't know that we wouldn't go home to the Philippines for almost two decades. We could not risk crossing borders until our immigration status was fixed. By then, many of the people on those tapes were dead. The sound of their voices overwritten with the Carpenters, John Denver, and the Jackson Five lost forever the stories that they stopped to record and mail to America 
the melody of how they loved us covered over the way green grass grows over a grave. Thank you very much. Grace, that was so beautiful. Thank you. I'm going to pass it over to Amy now. I have the pleasure of introducing TK Lay. TK is a writer and adjunct instructor from Westminster, California. She is currently writing a poetry collection called In This Strange Place. She is an alum of the Vona Voices Summer Writing Workshop and a 2019 Penn America Emerging Voices Fellow. Her fiction has been featured in Strange Horizons. Welcome, TK. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. And I am such a fan of everyone here, so I'm going to try not to freak out. Um, I'm also sharing my reading in case um, you take in information better that way. So I'll share four poems today. The first one is called The Harvest. She waits behind the kitchen door, a sickly yellow from years spent hungry, ushers me to the counter where she's unrolled and gathered all her newly dead, harvested from the blood red lips of country club mothers and tagged photos in an app she reads while straining to keep her eyes open. She finds cut hair and naked limbs, a Viet woman, early 20s, died on a desert hike. She wags a ringed finger at my workout pants, screeches, never go outside, while she herself clutches in her pocket the clinking keys to the car that cannot lock. Another older woman, also Viet, murdered by a room renter. He was Muslim. Her words knife the air. I try to stop her. She pulls her bullet train forward, never mind her stuttering kin, rolls over my hands, bounding for her throat. That's why I'll never rent, not in this house. She clicks her tongue so hard it echoes down the empty hallway she is walking towards. At the end lies an altar for a living brother, laundered suits and unscratched opera CDs, lit with stories picture pretty and children ungracious. Left in the dark, that old house on Lavender Avenue that smelled like incense and new money. In that house with the renter she told me to call uncle. In that two-story musty house, empty of words and so full of people. No one but my oldest sister minded my extended reading hours in his bed. It was in that house I learned to move on long before we were forced out. When we left for good, I carved with rock into loose shingle. I am here. Sometimes I think I still am there, uncomfortable and afraid, knees hugged to face, atop that roof overlooking our sickening past, our whitened future. Onward toward this new house, a new kitchen with marble countertops, good for butchering. It is in here I learned Viet people only matter when they are dead, and the only dead that matter have names like ours, and the only way to live is with eyes straining to stay open, and the only way to die is with gnashed teeth, and the only justice to be had is handed down by governments and not the people being crushed repeatedly under their arms. And the only sorry I'll ever get is sharp words down an empty spine. I'll never rent again. I am hungry, standing in that kitchen, tending to her bloody harvest. I am hungry, and I will take it. Close my eyes halfway, and I take it. So now I'm going to shift, because I didn't want to end on that note. <laughs> These are my fruity poems, which is why I have durian in the background. <laughs> Uh, the next poem is called Ring and it's after Ho Suan Tzu. My body rests in a supermarket bin. My coarse skin gives way to custard rot against your paring knife. Sweet prince, do your hands quarry the rough diamonds of mit or Ring? Best guard your kingdom than to come for mine. The Fisherwoman and the Fisherman. We fisherwomen could not find Selrying at the freezing markets of the strange place, but we had good noses and were willing to dig. One found embalmed beneath a freshly laid parking lot of Fuklok Ta, the fruit whose flavors so long beguiled us. The fisherman forbade us to eat, eat Selrying. The stench reminded them of past, of death. Late at night, as the fishermen slept with clenched fists, with dreams of holding power, we tiptoed to the freezer pulled out Saurian pulped and preserved in plastic containers out of the fisherman's line of sight. 
Our closed mouths became ovens, thawing out relics from lives we were told to leave. But why? We fisherwomen wept, our teeth cutting through fibrous fruit. Then one burst out a laugh, quickly covered her mouth. And one by one, we became alive again, a ripple of joy. Quietly, we laughed. At our success, at this clandestine indulgence, laughed at all the things the fish fishermen did not know. Laughed at how the fisherman so cared about the smell of Salryung, but not the foul odor of everything he left behind. Laughed about messes we had learned to clean with orange sprays whose names did not roll easy off the tongue or the skin. By morning, the evidence had been cleaned, wiped, triple bagged, and tossed outside. No stringy jaundiced pulp, no plump oval seeds in sight. Only a hint of it to those who bothered to notice. The stubborn and lingering scent, the mix of sweet and rot, kind of like the market square at the end of the day, or a dirty little secret. My last poem is called Mangosteens Two. How I think the fruit unremarkable, its purple skin like wood. A cut and cleave reveals tiny pillows. I pushed my tongue against white fruit and tender pulp. It parts to my teeth. A brown pit slips from lips to palm. A sticky trace remains. I close my mouth and let flesh feed flesh. How nourishing it is. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, TK. Beautiful poems. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Tony Robles. Tony is the people's poet. He was born in San Francisco and is the author of two collections of poetry and short stories, Cool Don't Live Here No More, A Letter to San Francisco, and Fingerprints of a Hunger, Hunger Strike. He was a shortlist nominee for Poet Laureate of San Francisco in 2018. Robles was named the Carl Sandburg Writer in Residence in 2020 in Flat Rock, North Carolina. His novel, The Hollow Hollow House, will be published in 2021 by Paloma Press. Thank you, Tony. Hey, what's up, everybody? How you doing? Um, TK, Paul, and Amy, uh, it's all about unity and it's beautiful being with you. And uh, it's an honor and a, and, a, and a pleasure and a privilege. And of course, uh, you know, reading with Grace Toulouse on what can I say? Uh, sister, it's always beautiful to see you. Uh, and uh, speaking of unity, uh, this is a poem about unity, and it's about unity in Frisco, my home. I'm living in the Blue Ridge Mountains, but you know it's all about Blue Ridge, from Blue Ridge to the Bay and everything in between. This is called uh, Unity in Black and Brown. In the projects of North Beach, there was cement and curved spaces and concave enclaves where shadows gathered and voices echoed laughter, bouncing in and out of blind spots as the sun hit at every imaginable angle. And swarms of dragonflies would descend from the sky, and I didn't know a dragonfly fly from a ladybug. And I saw them as flying spiders, and I was scared to walk out the door and into the swarm. But the sun hit me in the eyes, and there was Michael, who was five or six years older, and he would say, hey, go steal that, go steal this or that for me. He lived next door, and a few doors down in the other direction was Eric, a white kid with stained t-shirts who would pull fire alarms and take off running. And the dragonflies turned into fireflies, and the Catholic priest would come in a station wagon from time to time dropping off bags of donuts and the nuns would smile at our black and brown and yellow and white powdered sugar covered faces that was 1971 and i lived in the north beach project with my grandmother and uncle and i got away with way too much and i walked to school real slow up a big hill I was daydreaming uphill, not knowing the possibility of a downhill future. And as I was talking, or as I was taking my sweet time going up that hill towards Sarah B. Cooper School, I'd hear a loud honk. I'd look, and it was my grandfather in his copper 
colored Buick. He wore, he wore dark shades and a heavy working man's jacket. In the passenger seat was his best friend, Chris, a black man and a Filipino man, both bus drivers, both drinking cups of black and brown coffee, both knowing what uphill and downhill meant. Grandpa would roll the window down and he'd call out, hey boy, hurry your ass up and get to school before I whip your ass. And I hurried my ass up that hill while my grandpa and Chris watched from that Buick looking into the future. Okay, so there was always radio. Went to high school in Frisco, I went to Mission High School. Everybody had a radio, it was like a suitcase. It weighed about, you know, minimum 10, 15 pounds. And uh, I didn't have one of those, right? But they play in everything, Commodores, Heat Wave, Parliament, Funkadelic, everything I liked, right? And this is called K-A-N-T Radio, Kent Radio. Everybody listened to radio station K-A-N-T, the number one rated station. Used to see guys in high school carry big radios on their shoulders. And the DJ spun records as Kent filled the halls and our ears to and from class. Our ears dripped warm, hot, fast, slick, slippery sounds of Kant. And the sounds of Kant, K-A-N-T, pulsed in our blood as we snuck beer out of the liquor store. Kant was there when our cans, and was there with our cans and we emptied them like we couldn't get enough. Kant was on the radio when I was learning to drive. It was on when I got my first job delivering newspapers. And everywhere I went in my city, I heard Kant, K-A-N-T. I got so used to Kant that I heard it even when it wasn't there. And when the eviction crisis arrived, all those folks that had listened to Kant were informed that they can't remain in their city, their homes, no more. And that announcement was made over K-A-N-T. And one day I told my uncle that I was tired of listening to Kant all the time. My uncle was a philosopher. He looked at me as no one has ever looked at me. He paused and he said, maybe you just need to change the motherfucking station. Maybe I can. Thank you, D. Van. Thank you, Tony. Great poems and humorous as usual. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Amy. Um, Paul Tran is the recipient of the Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation and the Discovery Boston Review Poetry Prize. Their work appears in the New Yorker, Poetry Magazine, and elsewhere, including the movie Love Beats Rhymes with Azalea Banks, Common, and Jill Scott. Paul is a Wallace Stegner Fellow in Poetry at Stanford University. Welcome, Paul. Elegy with my mother's lipstick. I climb down to the ocean facing the Pacific where torrents of rain sure the sand. On the other side, my grandmother slept soundlessly in her bed, her aoyai of the whitest silk. My mother knew her mother died long before the telephone rang like bells announcing the last American helicopter leaving Saigon. Arrow shot back to its bow, long distance missile. I know she would fly home if she could. She works overtime instead, curls her hair with hat rollers, rouges her cheeks like Gong Li and raise the red lantern and I'm her understudy. Hiding in the doorways between her grief and mine, I apply her foundation to my face, conceal the parts of me that she conceals, puckering my lips as if kissing a man who would love me the way I want to be loved. I say all oh, their bewitching names aloud, twisted robes, fuchsia in Paris, irreverence. I picked the lipstick she would least approve wrapped a white towel around my waist and danced for hours in the kitchen, checking my reflection in a charred skillet. I laughed her laugh, the way my grandmother used to laugh when she was alive. 
when she taught me to pray from the dude I be when I braided her hair in unbearable heat, my tiny fingers weaving each silver strand into a fishtail, a French twist, each knot, another child she never got to name, another child buried somewhere in the barren plot of her where she keeps the image of her children locked away. I'm sorry, mother of my mother immortal bodhisattva with a thousand hands. No child in our family stays a child. Their mother can love. Thank you so much for having me and for organizing this event. And thank you so much to the readers. It is never lost on me, the occasion to be here with you. Um, my family came to United States from Vietnam in 1989 and my mom raised me as a single parent and worked three jobs so that I could dream of being a writer. And so it is an absolute honor to be here. And I have just one more poem. The poem is called Judith Slaying Hollow Fairies, and it's after the painting by Artemisia Gentileschi in 1620. Artemisia was one of the incredible artists of her time. And she was also known as a survivor of sexual assault and was one of the few women to testify publicly against her assailant. And the painting is after the story of Judith from the Bible, who, when an army of soldiers invaded her home, she and her maidservant traveled to the tent of the general and beheads him. So this is Judith slaying hollow fairies. I know better than to leave the house without my good dress, my good knife, like a crucifix between my stone breasts. Mother would have me whipped, would have me kneeling on rice until I shrilled so loud I rang the church bells. Didn't I tell you? She'd remind me that elegance is our revenge, that there are neither victims nor victors, but the bitch we envy in the end. I am that bitch. I am dogged. I am so damned, not even death wanted me. He set me back after you sacked my body, the way your army sacked my village, stacked our headless idols in the same river where our children impaled themselves on racks. I exit night. I enter your tent, gilded in this bolt of stubborn sunlight. My sleeves are already rolled up. I know what they'll say. Slut for showing this much skin. This irreverence for what is seen when I ask to be seen. Look at me. <laughs> My thigh lifts from your thigh. My mouth spits poison into your mouth. You nasty beauty, I'm no beast. But when my blade slides clean through your thick neck, while my maid keeps your blood off me and my good dress, it will be a song the Paris sings for centuries. Tell Mary, tell Eve, tell Salome and David about me. And watch all their faces like yours turn green. Thank you so much. Wow, so powerful. Thank you, Paul. So we have come to the end. Thank you so much to Devon. Thank you, uh, Grace, Tony, TK, Paul. Beautiful work. It was a true pleasure. Amy, thank you for co-hosting. Um, and thank you, Litquake, for having us.